007 Racing is a vehicles-only James Bond game made in 2000 and was exclusive to the PlayStation. Before I get into anything about the developer of this game or the game itself, I'll quickly touch on my personal experience with the pop culture icon that is James Bond. The 007 series is well known, but not all of us grew up enjoying it. Personally, I loved it as a kid. In fact, it was a major source of comfort to randomly come across one of the many Bond films playing during the day on TNT or TBS. It's a series of movies that allows you to turn your mind off and enjoy a silly universe of over-the-top, karate-chopping camp, while simultaneously showing off impressive chase scenes and special effects. There are cool gadgets, slick cars, exotic locales, and beautiful people walking out of the ocean like Godzilla. You'll see some of the most cartoonish villains outside of a comic book, and all the while cheesy one-liners are being sprayed all over the casino by James Bond. He had lots of guts! To top it off, the series has an iconic theme song that I totally hummed to myself while rolling around with a toy gun as a dumb kid. I know you're all waiting for me to say it, so I'll just get it over with. Yes, there are plenty of scenes in these movies that haven't aged well. James is, uh, well, yeah. yeah James is known to be weird around the ladies. Felix, say hello to Dink. Hi, Dink. Dink, say goodbye to Felix. Hmm? Uh, man talk. Oof. But look, what older movies don't have a few questionable things here and there? I'm looking at you, Holly Golightly. Plus, the series got better about this as time moved forward. Compare the Daniel Craig run to the Sean Connery run. It's night and day. One of my friends sits this one out. She's just dead. Ultimately, it's mindless fun with plenty of unintentionally laughable moments, though some are intentional. And you know, the bad guys always lose. It's a reliable formula every time. The movie always starts with an exciting chase or action sequence that usually isn't even related to the main plot. It cuts to a psychedelic intro with an original song sung by whatever diva or pop singer was popular at the time of the film's release. And then the rest of the movie is just big bad person doing big bad thing until 007 stops them. It's a custom that you can count on when you're experiencing fatigue from, you know, <laughs> good storytelling. Over the years, many video games have been made with this license. But GoldenEye 007 on the Nintendo 64 really set the world ablaze with Polygon Bond. The music, the weapons, the levels, the multiplayer, the Liddeller, the missions, the characters. It's hard to describe, but it all came together so well. The people at Rare really knocked it out of the park. It was the multiplayer game of the time and the main source of discussion and entertainment for my neighborhood friends and I for at least a year or two. The game was highly praised and sold very well. The potential to make lots of money with the James Bond name became quite clear. Nintendo, and subsequently EA, pumped out game after game to capitalize on that sweet 007 cash cow born from GoldenEye. Consider this. Between 1990 and 1997, the year GoldenEye came out, there were six James Bond games released, including GoldenEye. From 1998 to 2005, which is the same amount of time, 12 Bond games were released. But none of them really got it right, to be honest. The formula that was found in GoldenEye just couldn't be recreated in any of these other Bond games. Though, there is a big cult fanbase for the N64 version of The World Is Not Enough, or Twine, as it's lovingly known. The game was also released on PlayStation and Game Boy Color, but apparently those versions are so different that people consider them to be separate games entirely. So right in the middle of that hot, post-GoldenEye era, we have the 2000 release of 007 Racing. The car chase scenes are a huge part of the James Bond films, so why not make a game entirely based around that? Get rid of that cumbersome walking and shooting nonsense. Give us James at the wheel full time. Zeppelin Games was a UK-based development and publishing company that worked on a large number of games for the ZX Spectrum, Commodore 64, Atari 8-Bit and ST, and the Amiga. Helmed by Brian Jobling, who had started the company in 1987 at age 17 and had already been making games on his personal computers for years prior to that, Zeppelin put out a series of budget titles under different company names like Cognito and Impulse. In 1994, Zeppelin was acquired by the North American company Merit Studios and had their name changed to Merit Studios Europe. They put out a few PC and Super Nintendo games until 1997 when they transitioned yet again to Utechnics Limited. Beginning with the first name change, there was a gradual shift in the company to focus predominantly on vehicular video games. 
And to my knowledge, almost every game they made between 1997 and 2015 were car or racing games. With the exception of Warhammer 40,000 Storm of Vengeance on PC in 2014, which seems to be the second to last game they developed. During these years, they put out nearly 30 titles, of which we can see some NASCAR, Hot Wheels, Fast and Furious, F1, Le Mans, Pimp My Ride, Cartoon Network Racing, Hummer Badlands, Big Mother Truckas, and Big Mother Truckas 2, known in PAL regions as Big Mother Truckas 2, Truck Me Harder. Ugh. <laughs> Uh, okay, but most of all, are you ready for this one? Oh, man. <laughs> they did Ride to Hell Retribution. Yep. Actually, their London branch had to be closed down in 2013 after this game bombed hard. If you haven't heard of Ride to Hell, just look it up. There are plenty of videos online covering how awful and hilarious this thing is. Moving along, I'm not sure, but it seems that the company sort of ended in 2016. But yet again, it isn't very clear. It seems to be that a company called Zero Light took over, but I might be wrong about that. It's hard to get reliable information on this stuff sometimes. So anyways, back to the year 2000, it would now make sense to us that Eutechnics puts out the car-based Bond game 007 Racing. This is actually their second Bond game, as they re-released Domark's The Living Daylights on Atari back in 1989, but that's beside the point. 007 Racing is a, uh, it's a game, and I'm going to do my best to be positive here. I started this channel out wanting to all around avoid just taking craps on bad games. I think that's too easy, you know? I, like, Instead, I want to celebrate the good that can be found in even some of the worst games out there. That being said, well, let's just get into this. Now, pay attention, 007. I want you to take great care of this equipment. And you might be... Bond. James Bond. Collision coverage? Yes. Fire? Probably. Property destruction? Definitely. No more fault, eh? MGM worked with Eutechnics to write the story for this game, which is overall kind of just a hodgepodge of James Bond-ish things. Weapons are smuggled, people get double-crossed, the fate of the world is at stake, blah blah blah. I mean, I really don't have to explain this. The cars driven are pulled from different Bond films, which I think only kind of adds to the idea that this is more of an overall James Bond 007 experience, rather than another chapter in the book of Bond. Like the video game equivalent of a theme park ride put together by a table full of executives trying to loosely recollect memorable James Bond moments to incorporate into their 4D on rails 007 James Bond cart experience. Some of the original actors in the Bond films do technically appear in this game, since there are FMV sequences taken straight from the movies. But as far as voice actors are concerned, other than John Cleese, who is always great. Well, what are you then? I'm French! Why do you think I have this outrageous accent, you silly king? I didn't notice any of the original actors playing their on-screen counterparts. He plays Q in this, except that during this point in the 007 film timeline, the character of Q was called R, which is confusing. 
I think R was originally introduced as an assistant to Q in The World Is Not Enough, and then Q was R for several films, and then it went back to Q when R got promoted in Die Another Day. Look, I don't know, I just want to cover my butt. Either way, I'm calling him R in this video because that's what that character at this point in time is called. If you're Q, does that make him R? Ah, yes, the legendary 007 wit. Or at least half of it. Now... Rest in peace, Desmond Llewellyn. Satellite reconnaissance shows the fortress to be patrolled by armed guards. Each mission begins with not Judy Dench giving a briefing of the job. James, go get the bad guy, but make sure you don't mess up. After this, you go get the bad guy while making sure not to mess up. Other than some short CGI action cinematics at the end of certain levels, each portion of the story as it pertains to the level is told through text rather than shown, which is always an exciting way to do things and totally not making it apparent that the budget was small. The controls are pretty straightforward for driving games of the era. This was back when a face button, in this case X, would be used for acceleration, rather than the modern adoption of a shoulder button like R2. The game does support the analog sticks, which you would think is a plus, but the controls just felt too floaty that way, so I ended up using the D-pad most of the time. Square is brake and reverse, circle is handbrake, triangle switches between first and third vehicle perspective, L1 switches your weapons, and R1 fires said weapons. L2 switches the view to behind your car, which is necessary when you're being chased and need to time a smokescreen properly. Speaking of weapons, there are machine guns, rockets, homing missiles, a small shield that blocks your rear window, gasoline used to make enemies behind you slide on the road, and a smokescreen that also helps to get cars off your tail. All of these things, plus health packs, are found as floating pickups throughout each level. My first of many major complaints about this game is that the weapons always automatically switch when picking them up. So you'll be about to fire rockets at a road blockade, and instead you accidentally fire the one stinger missile you have because you didn't realize that the game automatically selected it a second ago. I didn't get used to this during my playthrough, and it was always aggravating. It was definitely one of the first indications that this game had hardly any playtesting done for it. I searched in the options, but there didn't seem to be any way to change it. If you shoot too many rockets, R will chime in with some swarmy comment. Completely unaware of the value of being frugal, 007. Why am I not surprised? He also does this if you crash the car too much, or do, really, anything else at all. Sometimes I swear you enjoy raising my blood pressure, 007! So needless to say, this gets old really fast. I like that the audio section in the pause menu lets you select what to listen to from the 8-tracks in the game, not including the Bond themes in the main menu. Alistair Brimble put together the music here, and some of the songs are pretty good. He worked on a gigantic amount of game soundtracks, most notably Mortal Kombat, the entire Dizzy series, Roller Coaster Tycoon and Roller Coaster Tycoon 2, Driver and Driver 2, Descent and Descent 2, The Lost Vikings, at least two XCOM games, Dungeon Master 2, the list goes on and on. Check this part out. <laughs> There's this song. Oh man. I think that the boy found the all right button. <laughs> Cause he is pressing it a lot. <laughs> It sounds like some of the stuff that a good friend and I got super drunk one night and made with MTV Music Generator on PS2. Full disclosure, there is a point in 007 Racing where I just chose to stop playing, simply because of how bad the game truly is, and I can guarantee you that many a sad kid did the same thing after getting home from Blockbuster. That point I'm referring to, of course, is the third level called Ambush. But first I'll take you through the chronology of events leading there, and we'll start to see some of the red flags for the unfortunate level of quality that this game has. 
First and foremost, 007 Racing is not a racing game, so you know we're already off to a great start when either the title is blatantly lying to us or the developers don't even know what the hell they just made. Instead, 007 Racing is a game where you are stuck in a car and performing various tasks that are arbitrarily assigned to you. The mission objective screen, that pops up before the level begins, spoils what will happen in such a lazy and uninspired way that it ruins any sort of excitement to be had. Oh. So I guess there will be a big helicopter that will show up and I will have to fight it using stinger missiles that I will find in a courtyard somewhere. Okay. I think it would have been better to be surprised by these elements within the level and act upon them myself. I don't know. I guess that it isn't a big deal or anything, it's just that it all feels so flaccid. The first level, which is set in a small country of Eastern Europe, has you immediately blowing up a gate and shooting some pedestrian enemies to rescue this person. At first I was like, oh sick, I can pull off the thing he does in the trailer for the new Bond film, No Time to Die. You know, James Bond makes machine guns pop out the front of the car and then he spins circles while shooting all the enemies down. It looks cool. The mission has been compromised. I didn't pull it off. So then it wasn't clear at all what you're supposed to do with the person that needed rescuing. She doesn't come over to you or anything, and I didn't want to run her over on accident, so I figured, okay, I cleared out all the bad guys and blew open the wall, so I guess she's saved. I moved forward in the level, getting more and more frustrated with the issue I previously mentioned of automatic weapon switching. And here was the famous helicopter that I knew was coming. You're supposed to hit it with a stinger missile, of which there are only two to be found in the whole level, but it spends the whole time hovering directly over your head and no matter how much you speed to the other side of this area and whip around to get a lock on, the helicopter is immediately caught up to be over your head. You can't look or aim up or down, and it's laughably bad when you realize that the very first level of this game is trying to have you do something that the inherent mechanics are not meant for. I said laughably bad, but you'll quickly go from disbelief to anger when you just want to get past this part. Upon replaying the level, I realize that your best bet is to be ready with your stinger and immediately shoot the helicopter when it appears. If you miss it, you might as well restart. So I ramp over this thing, go through a helicopter, and realize that I failed because I didn't save the lady from before. Okay, so I restart the level and run her over, which is what you're supposed to do. That's how you pick her up. Playing through it again made me realize how small these levels actually are. If you know what to do, you can beat the first level in about a minute or two. At the end, we get this cutscene that honestly isn't horrible, aside from Phil Hartman trying to do a British accent. What is it? We've got company. I had a few optional extras installed for just such occasions. The second level happens in New York City. In the first few moments, I did experience just a bit of Lodeller, but then the assets were repeated a lot, so the magic was kind of gone. Being that this game was made in 2000, the year of our lord PlayStation 2, the Twin Towers make an appearance. Only, they're the quadruplet towers because the background is doubled in two directions. The object of the level is to race around the city and collect these items before you blow up. It's entirely repetitive and the true cheapness of the game is first realized here. This level absolutely feels like it came from a budget title. Like something out of the Simple series. But the thing here is, this is a major license. How did they not have a bigger budget than this? I suppose a possible explanation is that this is a late cycle PS1 exclusive, but then why are they using this license for a game exclusive to the older console? I do like some of the silly voice acting here. The villain, who could either be French or German or I don't know, camps it up to an appropriate Bond villain level. Welcome to New York, Mr. Bond. I've taken the liberty to include a welcome gift with your car, to ensure your arrival is celebrated in the most explosive manner. And there's an overly American guy, which, as an American, is pretty funny to see parodied. Hey Jimmy, looks like you're in a bit of a pickle. So now we arrive at level 3, which is called Ambush, and takes place in New York City, just like the second level. As far as I'm concerned, there are two segments here, because I never made it past the second segment. I guess I could have just paid attention to the spoilery mission objective screen to find that that isn't the case, but whatever. In both segments, you are tasked with destroying vehicles that are constantly ramming you. In the first bit, which is initially difficult, but eventually manageable compared to the second bit, the enemies are respawning cars. Here is where, much like the helicopter segment from the first level, we come to find that the gameplay is not in tune with the mechanics whatsoever. Only this time, you can't stop to think of a workaround. The cars are constantly on your tail in this small space and the only way to destroy them is by facing them to fire your rockets or machine guns. The oil slick and smoke screen don't do any damage and honestly only stop their motion for a brief second. The absolute worst part about this is the collateral damage you receive from your own weapons, which can happen from what feels like a mile away in video game standards. 
How did they expect you to fire at these enemies without taking damage? I mean, this is crazy. Furthermore, the rockets alternate on either side of your car without a centralized aiming point, so sometimes you just miss because of this. To top it off, you have John Cleese not shutting up the whole time about how poorly you're doing, and now I don't want to watch Fish Called Wanda. Champagne. Ah! All right, you ready for how I handled this? My method was to drive quickly in a circle, shoot a rocket at this platform because the enemies are placed above the line of your machine gun fire, which is annoying, strategically pick up rockets, oil slick, and smoke screen as needed because it's totally possible to accidentally hit these pickups when your ammo is full and completely waste it, making it unavailable for later use, which you will absolutely need. Awkwardly crash into things as I look behind me to find the right moment to use the oil slick or smoke screen on the ensuing car enemies in order to give myself a fraction of a second to whip the car around and perfectly fire rockets that have a flawed aiming system at said cars. This is all done fully expecting to take damage, mind you. I mean, look how far away I am from the enemies when I take damage from hitting them with my own weapons. Also, remember that this is made even more frustrating by the fact that you will randomly be hitting pickups the whole time, and your weapon will keep changing to whatever you just picked up. It's stupid. It's just stupid. If you're lucky enough to get through this part, you're then supposed to blow up this gate in an alley which can only be done with a stinger missile, of which only one can be found in the area you were just fighting the cars in. So if you used that stinger during the fight, which is very likely, you'll now have to restart the level and fight the cars again while trying to avoid using that stinger missile, which will be difficult because you will automatically equip it if you touch it, which could very likely happen in the middle of you frantically trying to survive the stupid car battle. So now, in the second portion, we have the reason I quit playing the game. I gave a solid 12 or so attempts at this part before I decided to just stop. Look, as an adult, I have to sometimes choose my limited time left here on Earth wisely. I could very well be killed tomorrow, and I don't want my last moments to be spent wasting my time on a game made by people that couldn't even be bothered to play it themselves. I forced myself to finish reading books or watching movies that I wasn't enjoying, because I felt like perhaps there ultimately would be a payoff in the story, or I at least owed it to the passionate people behind the creative project to give the thing a proper chance before developing any sort of critical opinion. While I do consider video games to be a form of art, I don't believe that same ideology should be applied here. If you aren't enjoying a game, you're allowed to stop playing it and do something else, or play one of the many other better games that exist. I've made the mistake of playing all the way through Breath of Fire 1 and 2 because so many people love that series. I honestly hated them, I'm sorry. And yet I forced myself to play through them both to completion. I wasn't left with any sort of profound memory of the experience, it was honestly just a waste of my time. Though I am excited to play 3 and 4 for this channel, mostly for the art style, so I guess I haven't learned my lesson, I don't know. And I'm sorry if you love Breath of Fire 1 and 2. I mean no offense, and you're totally allowed to love those two games, just as I'm allowed to not love them. When the Shenmue 1 and 2 remasters came out in 2018, the forklift memes were happening in abundance online. However, I think people chose the wrong patron saint of annoying forklift video game segments. The two forklifts in this part remind me of early NES poorly programmed enemies that constantly attack you. Only this is in 3D and you're stuck in a car. Take everything I said about the previous car segment and apply it to this. The controls, auto weapon switching, limited weapon pickups, the collateral damage, having to face the enemy but not being able to, John Cleese getting all Cleesey and greasy and so on. Only this time, the enemies are forklifts that are faster and more responsive than you. Oh yeah, and they keep flipping your car over. Oh yeah, and you can only damage them by hitting them in the rear. Oh yeah, and they turn around faster than you do. I had no idea that forklifts had more horsepower and overall speed than the Aston Martin DB5. Wow, that makes total sense. On two of my many attempts, I tried to stay tucked in this alley and shoot the forks from here, but it didn't work. Watch right here where I approach the forklifts from behind and I'm shooting them with a machine gun, and then I die. Like, why did I take damage? Why did I die? I'm just shooting them with a machine gun. I don't understand this at all. That's years worth of patient research wasted. Yeah, this just killed any patience that I previously had with the game. It doesn't feel playtested at all. It feels like an early stage concept for a game without any of the kinks worked out. So on to the cheats I go. As a kid, one of my favorite things to do after beating a video game was to jump on the family Windows 95 PC for some sweet dial-up GameFAQs.com goodness. I always kept this code of ethics with myself about waiting to use cheats until I played through to the end of a game. It felt so rewarding, and I really miss this being a normal thing in games. I know I sound like an old man yelling at the sky, but it kind of sucks that any extra bits like this are now relegated to DLC. Oh well, 
So here we have some codes for the game, which confused me right away because I assumed you just input them in that cheats option we saw in the main menu. But no, these are all things you have to do in weird ways, which is fine usually. It's just strange to have a cheat section there and not be used in the way that makes sense. So I want to do the all levels unlocked here, so I can at least give you all a little bit more of a review. Okay, hold L1 at the main menu and press X, circle, X, circle. It doesn't work. I tried this multiple times and I checked to see if more levels showed up in the mission screen, but they didn't. I checked other websites and the same cheat code is listed. So I don't know. I don't know. At this point I've lost all interest in the game. Let's at least check that cheat option in the main menu and see what it gives. Oh! Oh my god. <laughs> what? <laughs> what is that? What are you doing? You're, you're breaking your bones! You need your bones! <laughs> oh, man. So these are all weird little placeholder videos for things you could eventually unlock. As if the game was fun enough to bother doing any of that. They're actually pretty funny videos to watch. They're so bad and of the time. But also they're short, so that's good. I spent so much of this video being negative, and I feel horrible about it, but I'm grasping at things to find that are good about this game. I can at least comment on the charm of the graphics from this era. Something about the late 90s, early 2000s PlayStation graphics are so special in their own blocky, jagged way. I love the way the trees look as you pass them. I love the few billboards with their made-up things. I love this fountain in the middle of the city. I love the birds all gathered on the ground that disperse and fly away as you approach them. I love how over the top and silly this MI6 headquarters looks. It has like kind of a vaporwave vibe to it, and it's also just outrageously gigantic. I love the way that the human enemies look. They remind me of the little guys in Simcopter. So this video is done now. I can't recommend this game. It's... it's bad. I, I really would like to hear if any of you were able to make it past these forklifts at some point. Maybe someday I'll revisit this in a live video with your help or something. Anyways, thank you for watching. Please subscribe. Be good to people. Bye.